Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tessa O'Sullivan. I am the Executive Director of the Hartford Medical Society, and I am pleased to share with you today a webinar on the three Connecticut physicians, a window to, this, to Civil War medicine. Today, I am honored to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Robert Bedard. <laughs> so Dr. Bedard has been a loyal member of the Hartford Medical Society since 1984, previously serving as both a board member and a two-term president. He was born and raised in Massachusetts and an alumnus, alumnus of Brown University and the University of Cincinnati Medical School. Following an internal medicine residency at MCH in Burlington, Vermont, he had a practice in Wisconsin. He then went on to an allergy immunology fellowship at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He opened an allergy practice at the Hartford Hospital community in uh, 1984. And in 1996, he merged with pediatric partners to form the Connecticut Asthma and Allergy. He retired at the end of 2015 and has remained a retired emeritus staff at Hartford Hospital. He has been a Civil War reenactor since 1987 as a Union Rifleman, an Assistant Regimental Surgeon, and now a Naval Surgeon with the, Mick, you're going to have to say what the, Keir Sarge, Keir Sarge after, after guard. guard, yes. Currently, he is the Treasurer of the Civil War Roundtable of D.C. It is my great honor to introduce Dr. Bedard. Thank you very much, Ms. O Mrs. O'Sullivan. Um, <laughs> it is a pleasure to address the Hartford Medical Society again. Um, I remain a member and have a number of very good friends and great memories of my experiences with the society. Um, my talk today is a distillate in, a, in some ways of a of a journal article uh, that was in Connecticut Medicine that was ably edited and helped by Dr. Crombie in 2009 uh, about Connecticut Civil War era doctors, as well as anesthesia, the Knight Army Hospital by Dr. Spar, and uh, uh, Lincoln's pre-war visit to Connecticut by Irving Moy. But I've, I've taken that issue and distilled it and in some ways added some things that have come to my, to my knowledge since. Um, a hundred, at least 110 doctors served the Union Army Navy and as contract surgeons during the Civil War, um, they aided and cared for the 65,000 Connecticuts who served in the Union Army. Um, and they did, in my opinion, they did a great job. Um, the three doctors I'm going to talk about, two would become members of the Hartford Medical Society. Uh, Melanchthon Storrs was the mature one of the three, and his portrait is in the possession of the Hartford Medical Society. Dr. Nathan Mayer, an immigrant and a student of not only science, but of letters and a student of Dr. Storrs, and the third is a Yaley, surgeon Frederick Dudley. Now, with a mix of compassion, endurance, ingenuity, knowledge, and skill, these three doctors did dealt with and saw terrible things during the Civil War. Uh, I believe they are great examples of physician service to the nation. And by highlighting their service, I want to use it to really, again, highlight the medical advances that were a result of the Civil War. 
um, make those important points, and at the end, debunk some commonly held areas, errors, not by this, not by the attendees of this conference, about Civil War medicine. Um, this is a listing of what I consider the great medical advances as a result of the conflict, the development of hospitals, and Dr. Spar has done great work highlighting the Knight Army Hospital in New Haven, uh, improved appreciation of sanitation, great ex expansion and experience in wound care, anesthesia, of course, and surgery, increasing skepticism of heroic treatments, the acceptance of women in nursing, and certainly the vast collection of medical observations that luminaries like Osler would build on into modern medicine. Let me just highlight the medicines of the Civil War. Very few were effective. Most were still based on the old humoral alien theory of disease where you rebalanced humors. Uh, if you had too much blood, you bled. Uh, most, the most effective of the medicines were certainly the anesthetics, and we'll discuss that. The opiates, morphia, morphine for pain and diarrhea, the Peruvian bark or Jesuits bark or quinine for the treatment of malarial type fevers. But met much of the medical table, medicine table available to doctors were really frankly toxic, a very narrow therapeutic index. Um, Hartford Hospital doctors used a lot of blue pill in the early 1860s. And the great physician Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. said, was quoted as saying, you could throw the medical supply table into the ocean to the benefit of mankind and to the detriment of the fishes. This is not a Connecticut physician. This is a, a man from Concord, New Hampshire, uh, Dr. Alfred Moulton, a Dartmouth graduate who had been in practice in, in, Connect, in Concord. And he is in camp at coastal, coastal South Carolina with his wife and one of his two sons. And he's providing care to the soldiers of the third New Hampshire volunteers. Um, and this is early in the war. This is an O'Sullivan print, by the way. And despite him being a well-trained, experienced physician, these are some of his patients, uh, men of the third New Hampshire, dying in early November, the early winter of 1861. This is way before the third New Hampshire ever went into battle with the Confederates. So despite his training, Despite his experience, he could not save these. And it highlights one of one of the important points of the of health and medicine that deaths due to disease far outnumber deaths due as a consequence of battle by a ratio of about two to one. Now Regimental surgeons, their task is to keep the soldiers healthy and in ranks. Certainly at camps of recruitment, the surgeon would do an entrance physical and important points that they would look for would be presence and adequacy of good teeth because they would have to tear cartridge and eat hardtack, uh, feet, presence of hernias or not, evidence of past smallpox or smallpox vaccinations. Uh, that would be, all be recorded and, and would be looked at again at, 
at discharge physicals. This is a watercolor done by Winslow Homer early in, early in the war. Winslow Homer, a Boston graphic artist, was, spent some time with the Army of the Potomac doing illustrations, but he also did watercolors and it shows and is titled The Old Soldier. Now, you look at that young man and you say, how can it be titled old? I think it's a pun in that this soldier is at, is getting, is answering sick call with the, with the purpose to malinger, to get out of duty. Regiment, soldiers, Union soldiers were organized into state regiments of about a thousand men each. And in Connecticut, uh, they were 30 regiments of infantry, several heavy artillery regiments and one cavalry regiment. Most of the men were young from farms, small towns, some of the factory cities in Connecticut. And it likely was the first time many of these were in larger groups beyond the meeting house, church, or saloon. And as a consequence, in these camps of instruction, childhood diseases became a major threat to health. Measles, mumps, chickenpox, scarlet, scarlet fever. The third Vermont in its camp of instruction in St. Johnsbury in the late spring, early summer of 1861, of its 1,000 enrollees, a third of them came down with measles within the month. So that would lead to attrition and loss of strength in a regiment. This is a household physician print of the stages of smallpox. Smallpox was another exanthem, more serious, often more serious than the childhood diseases. Uh, and that was endemic. And despite immunizations, which were often imperfect or avoidance of immunizations by soldiers, smallpox did take a toll on the strength of also strength of a regiment. And we'll hear about Dr. Mayer's experience with smallpox later. This is a graph done by Dr. Alfred Bullitt, who I believe is still alive. Uh, and it highlights the incidences of smallpox in the Union Army and in the solid line. So about seven in 1864, about seven and a half soldiers per thousand per year are, have smallpox. And it, the contract in contrast, it look in the dotted line is the mortality of that smallpox. While it's low incidence, it has a high mortality in 1863, 64, 65, ranging between 30 and 45 percent. Remember that as as we look at Dr. Mayer's experience treating soldiers with smallpox. This is our mature surgeon of the three, Dr. Melanchthon Storrs. Dr. Storrs was born in Colchester. He was 36 at his entry in, into the Union forces. He was practicing in Hartford. And uh, he would, he would do quite well through the war, through his service. He started with the 8th Connecticut Infantry and would be appointed chief surgeon at a Fort Monroe Fort in Virginia. And he would go on to become a, a brigade and then a division 
head surgeon. I find it remarkable that he was never sick in four years of service. And he was described as being, quote unquote, faithful, skillful, cool in peril, quick to see and steady and calm in executing. <clears throat> he would initially be in the same brigade or regiments together, the 8th, 8th Connecticut with, doc, with two of Dr. Ma, Ma, Mayer's regiments, and Dr. Mayer would learn from Dr. Storrs, and Dr. Storrs would be a dental patient to Dr. Mayer. Dr. Storrs performed a very complex resection of a upper femur of this gentleman, this gentleman, Captain Frederick Barber of the 16th Volunteer Regiment, after the Battle of Antietam. Unfortunately, Captain Barber would die two days later of a surgical fever. Dr. Storrs also uh, would, would do a number of surgeries after the Battle of Antietam. This is Dr. Mayer, and I believe this is probably a print just immediately post-war. He's wearing Major's tabs. Dr. Mayer was an immigrant born in Bavaria, came to Hartford with his father, who was Father Isaac, who was the rabbi at Beth Israel, Hartford's first synagogue. I'm proud to say he was educated at Daniel Drake's Ohio Medical School, which would subsequently become my alma mater, University of Cincinnati. And he took a number of Lectures two years in Europe, studying in Verona, Paris, Vienna, and Munich. At the call for surgeons, he was interviewed by Dr. Hunt of the Hartford Future Hartford Medical Society, Dr. Gordon Russell, the first Loving Cup recipient of the Hartford Medical Society, and Dr. Jewett, the chief, future chief of staff of the Knight Army Hospital and professor of anatomy at Yale. Uh, Dr. Spar has done a very good talk on Dr. Buckingham's surgeon selection panel. So Dr. Mayer passed that rigorous examination and he was accepted as a assistant surgeon to the 11th Connecticut in the same brigade as, as Dr. Storrs. Well, these regiments, would be camping in all types of weather. Uh, one of the theories of illness was that you became sick because of miasms. Miasms being the vapors or the, uh, the mist that would come off of decaying vegetation, night soil or swamps. And these miasms often carried the mosquito that transmitted the malaria parasite and would cause swamp fever among many of the many of the soldiers. Uh, often food would be contaminated as well and as a result food and water would be contaminated and as a result acute diarrhea would often become epidemic. Uh, this is again one of one of Dr. Bullitt's great slides, and this looks at early in the war cases per thousand, and in May and June of 1861, 1,400 soldiers out of every thousand uh, will report within a year acute diarrhea. It would drop down as Discipline within camps improved, but still be nearly half, half the soldiers per year would have acute and going on to chronic diarrhea. So to have the guts to be a soldier didn't mean, in my mind, courage, but, it, but could you tolerate acute and chronic diarrhea through your tenure as a soldier. 
one of the more serious diarrheal disease diseases is certainly was certainly typhoid. It could be recognized by telltale rose spots, uh, a discordance between temperature and pulse, uh, intense abdominal pain, bloody flux. And again, it was endemic. Uh, Lincoln's, one of Lincoln's sons would die in 1862, Willie from typhoid fever. Uh, and it, it had a high mortality, upwards of 20 to 50%. Keep that in mind as, as we look at Dr. Mayer's experience with treating typhoid cases. Dr. Mayer, when his regiment, the 11th, was campaigning in coastal Carolina, set up and ran several separate quarantined typhoid and smallpox field hospitals. Um, he had, he is, it's curious that his case mortality for these hospitals for the typhoid was only about 7% to two deaths out of 30, as opposed to what the record says was between 20 and 40% mortality. And his smallpox cases, only one died of 25 for a surprisingly very low 4% mortality index. Now, why was this? Well, he discovered some hidden eggs of beer and he supplied his soldiers in these two hospitals in what he called the Munich Manor, giving them beer. It likely improved morale. It was certainly sanitized hydration and nutrition. So the soldiers have, su have survived or those soldiers that remain have survived their camp of instruction, uh, their exposure to childhood illnesses, their acute and chronic diarrhea, and they're, they are marching off on campaign. The first major battle for Dr. Storrs and Dr. Mayer, and likely my third doctor, Dr. Dudley, was the we're at the bloodiest day in American history, September 17th, 1862, in the fields around Sharpsburg, Maryland, on the edge of, on, along the Antietam Creek. Uh, if you're Connecticut, if you're a Union historian, you call it the Battle of the Antietam. Uh, this is the destruction of Sedgwick's division as it goes into the battle against Jackson, Stonewall Jackson's troops by the Dunker Church. Uh, and it highlights that the Civil War was a war where the tactics were Napoleonic, but the weapons had evolved to greater killing power and greater killing distance as a result of the rifle musket. The rifle musket shot a, what was called a mini mine ball, which was, was conical that fit the groove of the musket and improved its distance, accuracy to some degree, and its hitting power. Most of the Union wounds, and that could be said for the Confederates as well, were due to gunshot, nearly gunshot and likely some shrapnel there from artillery. It's rare that the soldiers got to the point where they could use the shock tactics of either saber or bayonet to cause wounds. Dr. Mayer with the 11th Connecticut with Harlan's brigade crossed the Antietam Creek to treat and bring back 11th Connecticut wounded among them is Captain Griswold, who was a regimental messmate, friend, and often discussant of the great books that they would read. 
uh, in camp. He, Dr. Mayer would also assist Dr. Storrs of the 8th Connecticut doing operations and care at the Rohrbach farm after the battle. Dr. Storrs did most of the cutting. Dr. Mayer did immediate and post-op care. So we're even then getting specialization. Uh, the more mature doctor doing the surgery, the younger doctor doing the post-op care and chloroform anesthesia. Dr. Mayer, a man of letters, noted that, quote unquote, the wounded were exalted in spirit, full of patriotic fervor and asking for the battle's outcome. I think that quote might be for a comb consumption. This is a, a image of his friend, Dr. Mayer's friend, Captain John Griswold, who was sustained an abdominal gunshot wound and would die several days later. This is a picture of Dr. Anson Hurd of the 14th Indiana caring for what's felt to be Confederate, mortally wounded Confederate soldiers after the Battle of Antietam, uh, given pain relief in what sucker he can provide under, under these rudimentary shelter halves. The tools of the trade for doctors to do resections and amputations. I thank Dr. Costo for selling me a kit many years ago that I, one of my prized possessions. Now, the introduction of anesthesia in the 1840s allowed doctors to do complex resections and, and amputations, wound care, and be, we being the Hartford Medical Society and the Hartford Dental Society are firm believers that is Dr. Horace Wells, who was the discoverer of that magical, that, that anesthesia magic. Uh, if you're from Georgia, you might believe it's Dr. Crawford Long, who used ether in surgery, but did not report it until 1848. Again, Dr. Horace Wells demonstrated nitrous oxide and, and um, chloroform and ether for painless dentistry, failed to demonstrate it adequately for surgery, and it took his student, Dr. William Morton of Massachusetts, to demonstrate the successful use of ether for Dr. Warren's surgical patient at the ether dome and at the MGH. It's curious, and I thank Dr. McDonald for pointing this out to me, that Dr. Morton still owes $108 to Dr. Wells for his dental instruct, instruction. There is an annotated notary, a notar, noted, a notary signed IOU in Dr. Wells's daybook for that amount. <clears throat> Contrary to popular opinion, but not this, but not this group. Uh, Anesthesia was commonly used for surgery in wound care, and it was used in over 80,000 union cases. Image of an actual amputation under progress at Camp Letterman. Normally, the operating surgeon would not need this, these, this many assistance for that surgery. This was done at Camp Letterman. In the in August of 1863, An image of why amputations were often necessary. This is a humerus, I believe, and it shows a a ball that has struck it and causing jagged fragments that would be devitalized and be rubbing up against arteries and veins threatening the life of the 
injured soldier by exsanguination. And with every move of the, of the soldier's body, there would be pain. So the treatment would be a prompt amputation. I believe even Dr. Spar wouldn't be able to salvage this leg hit by round shot. And evidence of what would happen if wounds were left unattended or not given amputation. This is a femoral artery that has likely been occluded by the gunshot or shrapnel wound here, leading to dry mummification of the, of the foot. And then the more dreaded tissue eating wet gangrene treatment for these would be amputation. Now, the risk of dying from the wound and amputation is going to be directly related to how much tissue damage, blood loss, and how proximal to the body the, the wound is. An amputation or death due to amputate wound and amputation at the hip joint could run as high as 90%, while a wound in amputation of a finger was quite low at 3%. Makes sense. And the result of maybe half an hour, two hours of work by operating surgeon after a battle. And some soldiers after the Battle of Antietam, this young man, having had an amputation of the forefoot, forearm, another with an injury on the calf. So doctors, stores, and Dr. Mayer are treating soldiers like this after the Battle of Antietam. Dr. Mayer did his first amputation uh, in one of the preceding battles to Antietam in the South Mountain Passes. He would later become the chief surgeon to the 16th Connecticut uh, and care for yellow fever cases in, in Plymouth, North Carolina or during another coastal campaign. He was captured with most of that regiment, the 16th, when uh, the Confederates sprung a trap using a, a gunboat and in Plymouth, North Carolina, Dr. Mayer would be held for a while in the officer's prison at, at Libby Prison in Richmond until he was paroled. But unfortunately, many of the enlisted men of the 16th Connecticut were sent to Andersonville, where nearly 30% of them died. There's a very good book by a Simsbury born, now professor of history at University of Alabama, Professor Leslie Gordon on the 16th Connecticut. It's a modern history. And I think the best regimental history for a Connecticut regiment called the Broken Regiment. Uh, and this is available through LSU Press. I highly recommend this book. And there's lots of citations on Dr. Mayer within it. Dr. Mayer, after the war, would return to a practice in Hartford. He would become a board member and a, a medical attending at both a founding board member at both St. Francis and Mount Sinai. He, as I said, he was a man of letters and he would. He did poetry, art, drama, and a music critic for the Hartford Times. He would become president and toastmaster of the Hartford Medical Society, do a recitation for the first Loving Cup Award. He would also become the Surgeon General of Connecticut. Um, he is buried with other family members in Old Beth Page Cemetery in the West End of Hartford, picture of Dr. Mayer, courtesy of the Hartford Medical Society. Very dapper man of letters, skilled doctor, 
And his tombstone, I thought, was striking in that it his major line is surgeon, 16 Connecticut volunteers. Dr. St well, I'll, I'll come back to Dr. Storrs later on. My third doctor is Frederick Dudley. Frederick Dudley is the youngest of the three. And he's newly graduate of Yale College, a New Haven born young man. Uh, he was for a short time with the seventh Connecticut volunteers as a hospi hospital steward and was then appointed assistant surgeon to the 14th Connecticut volunteer infantry of the hard fighting second corps of the army of the Potomac. The 14th Connecticut is listed 40th among the 300 fighting regiments of the Union Army. The 14th was in hard battles with the Army of the Potomac from Antietam all the way to the to Lee's surrender at Appomattox. It took the most battlefield casualties of any Connecticut regiment during the Civil War. At Gettysburg, Dr. Dudley was wounded in the arm by a shell fragment during the bombardment before Pickett's charge. He would be sent to the Letterman Hospital, which was put together after the Battle of Gettysburg as they consolidated the wounded from farmhouses, farm barns, churches, into a large open air hospital encampment on York Road in Gettysburg. Um, supplies would come in, surgeons would come in, uh, treatment lasted in this hospital until late into 1863. And there were still patients there at the time of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So Dr. Dudley is a patient within this hospital and volunteer nurses would, would come in and he would be visited by this young woman, Cornelia Hancock. Cornelia Hancock is from Hancock Bridge, New Jersey. She's a young Quaker woman who was turned down by Dorothea Dix as not being mature enough to be a volunteer nurse. But nonetheless, she on her own went to Gettysburg and volunteered her services as a nurse at the Letterman Hospital. And she would pay a courtesy call or a sick call to Dr. Dudley while he was invaliding there, maybe providing him with some reading material, tobacco, just maybe a smile. Now, Mrs. Hancock and Dr. Dudley, after his recovery, would meet up again in early 1864 uh, during the winter encampment of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, nurse Hancock was assigned as a nurse to Dr. Dudley's Second Corps Hospital, Divisional Hospital, and she kept a diary, and that diary has been published, and it mentions Dr. Dudley almost daily until that hospital was closed and the army went on its campaign through the wilderness to, the, to Petersburg. Her writings, if you read between the lines, imply that despite tensions, her views on his drink, on Dr. Dudley's drinking, smoking, politics, bias, and profanity, they worked well together with with mutual respect. The doc, Dr. Dudley and, doc, and Nurse Hancock. Uh, volunteer nurses were, became very important in hospitals across the North. Um, spelling doctors, spelling hospital stewards, providing here to soldiers, they would be brought in by Dorothea Dix or a volunteer 
such as Miss Hancock. They might also have come in through the auspices of Clara Barton and people like Mother Beckerdyke. Dr. Dudley was captured in October of 1864, caring for wounded in a, a collecting point. He would be in, in, I believe, Libby Prison. And Dr. Miss Hancock was worried about him during that while he was missing. And he would then on parole return to the 14th Connecticut for the remainder of the war and serve through Appomattox. Dr. Dudley and Nurse Hancock would go separate ways after the war. Dr. Dudley on discharge would move and practice and raise a family in the Finger Lakes area of New York. Nurse Hancock would continue with philanthropy uh, nursing and organized Freeman schools and an orphanage in Philadelphia. Carolyn Ivanoff, who is online with us today, has looked into her letters with her family and has found out that her letters from Dr. Dudley were burned upon her death unread by her family. And it's curious as to why. So, Dr. Storrs would return to Hartford, become a staff member at Hartford Hospital and also member and future president and, and future president at, of the Hartford Medical Society. He would unfortunately die as a consequence of a scalpel nick as he was draining a case of empyema in 1960. He would die as a consequence of that unfortunate surgical mistake. Uh, colleagues, comrades of arms, HMS members together, Dr. Storrs and Dr. Meyer. We talked about Ms. Hancock and Dr. Dudley. So points uh, that I've made at the start of the talk, the develop of, of the field hospital, in its apotheosis is the, is the Letterman Field Hospital after Gettysburg, improved appreciation of sanitation as camps became more disciplined, there was more attention to clean water, appropriate treatment of night soil, better food and lodging, a great experience in wound care, anesthesia, and surgery, increasing skepticism of the heroic treatments, the blue mass, the blue pill, the heavy arsenics, acceptance of clear acceptance of women in nursing, and then the vast collection for luminaries such as Osler in the future. For this group, I do not have to stress this as much, but when I give talks to lay to lay folks, the misconceptions about anesthesia are rampant. Many they think, well, all these treatments were done by biting the bullet. No, anesthesia was commonly used. That soldiers died of disease, died of the bug, more to than died of wounds. The role of bacteria in disease had while bacteria were seen under microscopes, their relationship, their pathogen, pathogenetic cause in disease had not been illuminated by some people in the future like Koch and Pasteur. So I stress to the lay people that you need, we need to judge mid 19th century doctors on how they did with their abilities and their that that knowledge of their period, and not to judge them about what is known now about disease infection in medicine. I want to thank Hartford Medical Society. Thank you, Miss Morris and Mrs. O'Sullivan, 
for asking me to to give hopefully hopefully not my swan song to the HMS Society. Uh, this will be this is a paired talk, and next week I will be doing a talk on Civil War naval medicine and comparing it and contrasting to the features of this talk today. Thank you very much. Um, I did this really to give tribute to the three surgeons that I highlighted and also a tribute to members of the Hartford Medical Society who've served in military service from the Civil War even to the present. And I would cite people like Ralph Knoll, Dr. Middleman, Dr. Crombie, Dr. Spar, Dr. McDonald, Dr. Brown. I, I salute you all. <laughs>